All right, thank you, and thank you for, for coming along. Let's talk about health. Um, so this applies to everyone in this room right now. If you're interested in living a healthier lifestyle or feeling healthier, there's four main principles. And you probably already know what these principles are, but I'll, I'll go through them nonetheless. The first one is don't smoke. And if you do smoke, try and quit as quickly <laughs> as you can. The second one is around drinking. So if you drink alcohol, do your best to drink in moderation. In terms of diet, what you want to do is eat a diet that's really high in fiber, but is also really full of lots of fruit and vegetables. And the last one's around physical activity. So you want to try and engage in as much physical activity as you can. The guidelines suggest about half an hour to an hour, most days, if not, if not all days of the week. Those health messages apply to people that don't have a mental illness, and they absolutely apply to people that are living with you know, quite severe mental illnesses as well. The issue, or the problem, is that we know that people that are living with quite severe mental health problems have much poorer health than people from the general population. So what I want to do tonight is present some of the research and talk about some of the ideas behind the, the research program that we're focused on, which is really centered around trying to improve the physical health and, and really in trying to improve the life of people that are living with severe mental health problems. So let's begin with smoking, because smoking is one of the biggest issues for people with severe mental health problems. I don't, want to, I don't want to oversimplify the academic literature too much on, on smoking, but here it is in a nutshell. There's absolutely no health benefits of, of smoking, and smoking is incredibly bad for our physical health. Really, really bad. Um, a study published in um, 2004 in a you know, really prominent academic journal looked at why people die in, in America, which probably f reflects pretty closely to here in Australia. What they found was that smoking was the single largest cause of death for the whole population. On top of that, smoking was responsible for more deaths than murders, motor vehicle accidents, HIV, suicide, alcohol abuse, drug abuse combined. Combined. Smoking has a dramatic impact on the health of, of populations. It's a significant contributor to cardiovascular disease and results in some of the deadliest cancers. I guess the opportunity that we have as health professionals or as researchers is we can do something about smoking. We know if we can help reduce smoking rates across populations, we can really significantly improve the physical health of those populations. We can help them to live longer. Probably more importantly, we can help improve their quality of life. So if you have a look at the, the figure behind me, these are smoking rates across the Australian population. And the, the shape of this graph is ex exactly what we'd be hoping for. You'll see that um, around the sort of the late 70s, early 80s, you know, smoking rates were quite high. And there's just been a gradual reduction over time. In Australia, we're at smoking rates at about 14, 15% of the general population. Part of the reason we've been quite successful in reducing smoking rates in Australia is we've had really quite proactive governments who have introduced smoking legislation and public health policies that have appeared to make you know, really meaningful change. So you're probably aware of it that it's now really difficult for tobacco industry to advertise any of their products. There's been taxation on smoking. There's been those gruesome health messages that are now on the, the sides of all of the cigarette packages. Those approaches, the general consensus is they've made a difference and that's what's contributed to that, that trend. In terms of a, a, a public health issue, we haven't solved the problem. We would much prefer no one in Australia to be smoking it, you know, I th and I think there's a lot of improvement of getting it down from 14%, from but it's heading in the right direction. There's, there's definitely room for optimism in terms of smoking and the general population. However, once we move to some of the more disadvantaged populations, that's where we haven't done as nearly as much in terms of reducing smoking. So as I said, smoking's down to about 15% of the general population. If we look at people that are living with severe mental health problems, smoking rates are up at around 50%, and we've, we've certainly done research where it's higher than that, 60, 70%. It's a really high proportion of people that smoke. And when we're talking about people with severe mental health problems that, that smoke, they're not just your casual smokers. In the literature, they're actually described as hardcore smokers. So they smoke more cigarettes. They smoke them right down to the butt. They're chain smoking throughout most of the day. 
if we ever want to do some, make meaningful change in terms of people that are living with severe mental health problems, if we really want to improve their health, we absolutely need to do something about their smoking rates. So, it's kind of alarming, but the life expectancy for someone that's living with a severe mental health problem is about 15 to 20 years less than the general population. 15 to 20 years less than the general population. That's one and a half to nearly two decades that these people, on average, are, are losing off their lives. I guess the point to, to really remember, I'd like you to kind of take this message home with you, is it, on the whole, it's not their mental health problem that's contributing to that. It's their physical health problems. 80% of the, the reason that people with severe mental health die is a result of their physical health problems. The National Commission on Mental Health um, released a, what they called a report card on the, the state of our mental health system and the, the state of, of people living with, with mental illness in Australia. They described the physical health of, of people with severe mental health problems as a national disgrace. It's really, really strong language and it's kind of really highlighting the, I guess, the significant issue associated with this. Clearly, public health messages and campaigns haven't reached people with severe mental health problems. You could argue that they're, you know, they're working um, you know, quite, quite, quite in large for, for the general population, but not for people with severe mental health problems. It's kind of a little embarrassing to actually <laughs> to talk about this, this next bit, but I, I think us as clinicians have really done people with severe mental health problems quite a disservice and maybe not focused on, on you know, physical health as much, as much as we should. I'm a graduate here of the University of Wollongong. I guess, guess lots of people in this room probably are. When I finished my undergraduate studies, I went and worked in the local drug and alcohol services, so in non-government and, and government drug and alcohol services. Um, probably aware that drug and alcohol use is considered a mental health problem in itself, but also people attending these programs also have really, really high rates of other mental health problems as well. The most striking thing, or the thing that I remember, or the smell that I remember from working in those, those services was coming home each day, just reeking of cigarette smoke, just smelling of cigarette smoke and wanting to get out of my clothes. And the embarrassing part is, we didn't do anything about people smoking. We didn't talk about diet. We didn't talk about physical activity as, as part of their treatment. If anything, we actually encouraged, we were taught that if people were to give up smoking at the same time that they were trying to address their drug and alcohol problems, it would be a bad thing. And so we would encourage participants to continue to smoke. It's bananas, just absolutely, absolutely ridiculous. We now know that it's possible. It's possible to help people reduce their smoking. It's possible to help people improve their health behaviours. And it actually improves their mental health outcomes. And it improves their drug and alcohol outcomes, plus they're, plus they're healthier. But that message hasn't quite got into routine practice yet. So, I guess now to, now to the area of research that we're focused on. I guess my early experiences working across those settings really kind of shaped the types of research programs, the types of research questions that I was interested in addressing. And it's really focused on how can we get evidence-based, physical health type preventative um, education, but also um, you know, different programs into routine care. So I'm fortunate to work with um, lots of really talented students and, and really great research assistants and clinicians, some of them here in the audience. Um, had some great mentorships, so Professor Frank Dean, who works here at the University of Wollongong, Professor Amanda Baker, who's up at the University of Newcastle. I guess as a team, we've really been, you know, I guess, challenging ourselves to think, how can we develop programs that can be actually used in routine care and continue to help improve the people with severe mental health problems? So at the moment, we're running a couple of different, different programs. So we're really fortunate to get some funding from the Cancer Institute New South Wales, and we're running a large randomised control trial in collaboration with the Salvation Army. So we developed a, a healthy lifestyle approach that focuses on diet, physical activity, and, and smoking. And we're working in partnership with the staff of the Salvation Army, who provide these big, large residential drug and alcohol services to deliver these programs across their, their sites. And we're fortunate to get some funding from the Heart Foundation where we're trialling the same healthy recovery program but we're doing it in Indigenous settings. So we're working with an organisation over in Alice Springs and another service up in Mount Isa, really trying to make sure that our interventions and our approaches are really appropriate and meaningful for Aboriginal Australians. 
we're just about to start a, a new pilot study, which, which I think I think's really interesting. We're working with an organisation called NEMI, um, who are a really large provider of mental health services a, across Australia. They're also a large employer of peer workers. So a peer worker is someone who has their own lived experience of a mental health problem, but they work within the mental health system and they, they kind of work in meaningful roles within the mental health system. So what we're doing with NEMI is we're training up their peer workers in a telephone delivered healthy lifestyle intervention. And the idea of a telephone delivered intervention is that they can access mental health consumers from across Australia. We haven't solved the problems in terms of trying to improve the physical health of people with, with severe mental illness. It's, a, it's absolutely a work in progress. If I was to leave you with a couple of take home messages, and I guess these are the sort of take home messages I remind myself is, it's absolutely possible. We have no problems in recruiting participants to our study, trying to convince people in drug and alcohol settings or mental health settings to be involved in, in healthy lifestyle approaches is really quite easy. People want to improve their physical health. It's, it's something that's on their agenda. I think what we need to remember as researchers and clinicians is that we, we don't underestimate people living with severe mental health problems, but we make sure that we you know providing services for them that are meaningful and can really help to improve their quality of life. Thanks for your time.